nun abstoßen, was sich aus schlechter Wesen hat und deshalb innerlich nicht zu uns gehört. The appointment of Adolf Hitler as German Chancellor in 1933 presaged one of the darkest and most stagnant periods in the history of Western art and culture to date. Focused on preservation rather than innovation, Hitler gave his propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, the task of regulating cultural life in Germany, predominantly in order to ensure that Jews, blacks and gypsies could be filtered out of society and prevented from sullying Germany's great artistic heritage. The cabaret and jazz scene, for which Berlin had been so well renowned during the Weimar era of the 1920s, was one of the first victims to feel the heat of Nazi persecution when censorship was reintroduced. By October 1935, the Reich Culture Chamber had imposed a ban on black and Jewish jazz from the airwaves, and in its place, Goebbels instructed radio programmers to play Aryanized light dance music. Jazz was denigrated as an act of musical race defilement, and black artists were banned from giving concerts in the fatherland. Disgusted by the supposedly base and inferior origins of jazz, Nazi propagandists began to map both Jewish and black stereotypes onto the music simultaneously, until the two were blurred into one primitive and corrupting enemy. Goebbels dismissed jazz as what he described as nigger kike music. Um, so it was it was doubly damned, in a sense, because it was associated with blacks and it was associated with Jews, particularly through the songwriters in Tin Pan Alley and so forth. So um, it was simply not countenanced in any shape or form. Besides the radio ban on jazz and a handful of small-scale restrictions issued throughout the 1930s by police and party members in the provincial backwaters of Germany, an official Reichwide ban on jazz in all its manifestations was never officially enforced. This was in part due to the lack of a clear-cut, centralized policy, and also because Goebbels believed that persuasion rather than outright prohibition could be more effective. What's more, culture chamber officials were often at a loss to define the technical musical differences between black and Jewish jazz and the more tolerable white symphonic jazz, rendering effective regulation of the music difficult. You know, there's a sense in which jazz music isn't pin downable enough. You get an image, you get a, a, a piece of degenerate art, and you can immediately say that's degenerate because of this, that and the other. People try to do that with jazz. They try to say, well, it's degenerate because it doesn't have, it's not written down, it's not got this, that and the other. But it, it's actually harder to pin that label on it. In the end, they just say, well, it's nigger music. You know, it's made by blacks originally, and that's how you can... And, you know, and that works for some Nazis. However, in the late 1930s and throughout the war, for those who were caught indulging in black, Jewish or American jazz, the penalties could be harsh. Listening to jazz records or a foreign radio station could result in a lengthy concentration camp sentence. When Hitler's panzers swept through France in the spring of 1940, it remained to be seen whether Goebbels would eventually govern cultural activity there equally severely as he had in Germany. The Parisian jazz community held its breath, fearing an end to the city's long and well-earned history of artistic freedom. Paris sera toujours Paris, la plus belle ville du monde, malgré l'obscurité... Returning to Paris from London in September 1939, Django found that the capital had altered very little since war had been declared. The French army was mobilized with speed and efficiency, but very few felt an enemy invasion possible, believing the Maginot Line to be an impregnable defense against Hitler's forces. On May the 12th, 1940, news of the German invasion of France reached Paris. Days later, thousands of refugees from the northeast of France began to arrive in Paris. Over the coming weeks, hundreds of thousands of Parisians followed suit, Django and his family amongst them, fleeing towards the south of France. At 5.30 a.m. on June the 14th, 1940, the Germans entered Paris by the Porte de Villette and occupied the city without force. 
the Germans walked into Paris without a shot being fired in her defense. And there are these photographs of Hitler and the chiefs of staff by the Eiffel Tower. It becomes ideologically a, 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 almost acceptable looking because you've done it with a, and this sounds a terrible thing to say, but in a, in a way with a degree of graciousness. Django feared for his life, yet he returned to Paris soon after the armistice had been signed. Hopeful that his reputation as a talented performer would help him, Django made arrangements to appear in front of the Nazis' official censorship bureau in Paris. On the condition that his concert programs were submitted for approval before every performance he gave, and warned that bureau officials kept a close eye on performers' actions, Django was free to work again. As the weeks passed by, merchants and restaurateurs, their livelihoods in the balance, reopened for business as usual. Soon enough, the City of Light was illuminated once more, and its inhabitants sought escapism and light relief. Swing was the word on everyone's lips. It wasn't only civilians who sought relief. The German Wehrmacht was looking for entertainment too, and endeavoured to exploit the city's resources to their best potential, even requisitioning many clubs and cabarets for their own use. Montmartre was to retain its status as the pleasure district of Paris. By the autumn of 1940, Django had formed a new quintet of the Hot Club of France. Replacing Grappelli's violin with a clarinet and one of his rhythm guitarists with a drummer, the new quintet had a distinctly American sound, a daring move on Django's part at a time when all things American were under suspicion. By late 1940, Django was a phenomenon, commanding huge fees and eating in the best restaurants while others around him tried to make ends meet. Not only were his records outselling those of the pre-war quintet several times over, but with Stefan Grappelli out of the picture, Django reveled in no longer having to share the limelight with anyone. This was at a point at when jazz was extending, its popularity was extending beyond what it had been, I think, to a degree in the 1930s. It was very much a kind of enclave, aficionados, and so on. A swing became genuinely popular, as it, as it had been previously in America. And the figure most strongly identified with that was the figure of Django Reinhardt. So in that sense, he had a higher profile than I think anybody else who was working. I think that someone like Django Reinhardt's jazz music is, is a beacon of freedom for, for French people. They're sitting there and they're thinking, well, you know, they can't oppress this, they can't stop this. We're not going to have to listen to that German martial music. Noirge, a piece written and recorded by Django in late 1940, was hummed by fans everywhere, replacing the forbidden Marseillaise as an unofficial national anthem. When released on record, Noirge immediately sold 100,000 copies, almost doubling Django's fortunes overnight. Though food and fuel shortages were evident by early 1941, Django never had to go without, as almost anything could be bought at a price in Paris at this time. The first two years of occupation continued to bring still more varied work for Django and the Quintet, with tours of Belgium, the Côte d'Azur, and even the promise of further dates in Algiers. People continued to marvel at the seemingly inexplicable way in which this gypsy musician not only defied persecution at the hands of the Nazis, but now even managed to travel freely between countries.